Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 162 of the Kiss Army Nation podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Pasquale Vary. And I am Claudia Espera. Welcome to the show, everyone. Born in Cranston, Rhode Island, our next guest is a writer, editor, and actor. He is known for his work on Barbed Wire, Mimic, and of course, Detroit Rock City. He is also the author of The 13th Story Asylum. Kiss Army, you all know who this man is. Let's welcome Carl Dupre. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So Good nice time. to have you, Carl. So uh, thank you for your time. This is great to have you. So cool. So cool. Uh, likewise. Likewise. Uh, you know, Carl, from, from your website, uh, carldupre.com, it's clear you have a fascination with horror stories and movies. But as a young Carl Dupre, so what were your influences? Was it the music, movies, books, or all of the above? Well, I love this question a lot because you're reminding me that um, uh, I had a very rich and uh, just very diverse childhood where I was getting, I, 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 I love just, um, I loved going to the movies. I remember one of the first uh, memories I have of going to the movies is um, uh, seeing Godzilla versus Monster Zero, AKA mm -hmm. uh, Ghidorah, the three-headed monster. Um, yeah, like I said, I was five years old and I was watching it and my mom reminded me of it, but we, we uh, I grew up somewhat, my dad was in the army. So um, we spent some time in uh, what is, I guess what is now uh, Western, West Germany. It used to be West Germany, but it's just Germany now, but that's how far back I go. Um, but, you know, we were watching in this movie theater that was kind of a makeshift, uh, just had a, like a, a big sort of curtain. It didn't really have a screen. It had like kind of like this curtain and they showed it on there and they would like these kind of fold out chairs and whatnot. And I was just, I was just enthralled. I, and I just remember watching that. And I know now, like it was, you know, it was a guy in a big rubber suit. The effects were uh, kind of crappy, you know, but, <laughs> but I, I, I just, I felt like I want to be a part of this somehow. What is this? You know, this is this, it. It really was wonderful to me. You know, there's there's a larger than life element, of course, when you're watching on the big screen. But this pretend universe um, that's created uh, and where anything can happen, and I mean, I just I just really really love that. And then as I went along, yes, I would say movies first, then music. Um, I grew up. Um, in a family that short, they weren't like Mrs. Bruce in uh, Detroit Rock City at all. They, they, but nonetheless, they had preferences. You know, they really did have like the Carly Simon and the Carpenters, and you know, there were there were a bunch of others that I remember. They're just like the kind of Muzak sounding uh, records nowadays. We listen to AM radio. I mean, if you know, you know. I I don't want to have to explain AM, AM mm -hmm. radio yeah. to people, but it's basically just all, soft rock. It's uh you know that's that's what it was back then and F FM was kind of frowned upon. That was really you had like the the rock and roll music and uh, you know the you know kind of edgy the edgy pop music. Um, but uh, they kind of loosened up after a while. Um, my family and and like I discovered um through it was like through my peers really like uh, family members that were my age. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, schoolmates and whatnot, uh, that other bands, there's other music out there and it was exciting. And it was, you know, it was, it was uh, The Who, Led Zeppelin, um, Pink Floyd, of course, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, of course, Kiss, of course, uh, yes. you know, uh, of course. Um, but um, that was like the next thing. That was the next thing that really sunk in and, and, and I enjoy music quite a bit. Um, and I, I, I like to think of, um, I mean, I, I'm the type of person that really can just sit, sit back um, and, and listen to an album. You know, I can just like sit and, and like, you know, somebody say, hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm listening, listening to a record album. What? That's it? That's all you're doing? Yeah, you know. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm an appreciator. I, I'm, I'm really, really an appreciator of music. Um, and especially like that music that I grew up with. And, you know, just how wonderful all that was. And 
I mean, I, I know, uh, and I know you, you, you guys can kind of relate. Um, you look maybe a little younger than me, but I know that, uh, you know, you can appreciate the, the, the music of that era. Um, you know, just really uh, uh, um, terrific. And, and it, it, was, it was a turbulent time. There's a, there a lot going on. There's a lot of experimentation mm -hmm. going on. And um, as well as, you know, uh, rock just kind of working its way into heavier rock working its way into pop also um and then finally finally uh finally i learned how to read no i mean i learned <laughs> I, I i started getting i started getting into books um when i was uh i don't know like 10 years old i want to say I started like getting and of course like the only books that really <laughs> interested me at all were like stephen king um, you know, uh, uh, Harlan Ellison, uh, Philip K. Dick, you know, all these like all these authors that dabbled in, well, of course, horror, science fiction, fantasy. Um, uh, I read uh, The Hobbit was the first book that I read where I actually felt like I was tr transported someplace else in my head. And it was such a, a fantastic feeling. I was like, oh, my God. I, I, it was this. It was this scene with the Gollum in the cave. You know, uh, Bilbo and, and and Gollum in the cave. I don't know if you ever read that book, but there's a there's a scene in the cave where it's just so vivid, and I'm so into that that, that book. Like, I don't know how much time passed, um, but um, that began this like really uh, this love affair with books. And I read a book called um, Night Shift by Stephen King, and it was a collection. Okay. It was actually a collection of short stories. So technically, it wasn't. He didn't write it as a book. It was just a, the, the publishers compiled a collection of his short stories that had been published up to that time. And I can't remember exactly how many stories were in it, you know, probably about 20, I want to say. But they were all so good. And, and I think I read it at just the right time in my life. And I said, wouldn't that be great to actually do a book like this, but on purpose? Like that, I had that idea way back then. So there was that germ that was uh, put in there like, Someday I'd like to, you know, create a book like this. Yeah, make it happen. But from right. from from one, right. you know, not not try to go get the stories published and then, you know, later compile and just make that make that complex. So it's so it went in that order. When movies, music, books. Are you just uh, you just mentioned uh, Detroit Rock City, and uh, of course we're going to talk about it a bit later, but. Um... Uh, you know, being being uh, such a, a young a young uh, Car du Pre, you know, surrounded by movies, books, and music. Uh, you mentioned, you know, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd. So, how does Kiss fit into the story? Oh, absolutely, yes. And uh, uh, this is like the first time that I have that I remember telling this story. But I was at a summer camp, and um, Kiss was on tour. They were on the Alive Two tour, and they were due to come to the Providence Civic Center. But I had heard the name of the band Kiss, of course. They're very popular. Um, I only knew at that time, like, uh, Dr. Love or something. Like, I knew that song. I may have heard of maybe Christine or whatever. But um, I, I uh, and I think I saw a Rolling Stone article with their picture. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is kind of weird. They, uh, they did look like, a novelty act i'll be honest they looked like a novelty thing they didn't look like a real band but i heard these guys talking about it and they started talking about kiss it's music and they started talking about the stage show and there was something about that and i'm sure like i'm sure that you know um that spoke to all the different elements that were going on at the time because there was something there's something very movie like and very, very horror story like about uh -huh. their show. And um, I was getting these snippets and I'm like, Oh my God, this guy, like he spits blood, he blows fire. And there are these fireworks going off and the guys, <laughs> guys, guitar smokes. And, and, and it just, it just, it was it like, it, it turned me on, you know, it was like, wow, that's really cool. That's like, it sounds like something that I just want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So I think like many, um, like many, Kiss fans, I think I was um, taken in by that Kiss mystique, by the okay. mystique of Kiss. The music was still pretty good. I think I, I think um, Dest Destroyer is 
um, that's a Desert Island album for me, you know? Mm -hmm. That really is, like, every track on that is gold, I mm -hmm. I think. I uh, uh, It's as perfect as an album can get, you know? Um, and up there with all the greats, I would say. Um, but uh, but I went right home. And it was like, and I begged my mother, actually, ironically, my mother took me to see a Kiss concert. People ask me sometimes, oh, do you have a, a problem with uh, because of the character of the mother in Detroit Rock City is uh, kind of the villain. But I said, no, my mom actually took me to see Kiss. And we, um, I had to like gorge myself on Kiss albums too. Like that was kind of like, uh, you know, I, I mean, of course I had, that was understood. But then I went to this concert and I was, and it was loud. It was really loud. I was, I was 11 years old. But I was just, I was just enthralled, and um, that was like uh, a moment in my youth. It was, it's an indelible, you know, memory of just seeing them perform and seeing all the pyrotechnics and the special effects. And um, you know, it, 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 I saw one concert before that. I believe it was the Electric Light Orchestra, and it was, it was actually kind of. Uh, I mean, no disrespect to Jeff Lynn and, and company, but um, it wasn't, it was just like some lasers basically. Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't really do too much in the way of like, they didn't, there's like no showmanship the way there is in a Kiss concert. I still like ELO a lot, but, but anyway, um, the, the Kiss show just um, shook something loose inside me. And I was like, and, and, um, you know, it, 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 it was like, wow, this, the, the genre of rock and roll, like that's, that was my introduction to the, to really the genre of rock and roll. Um, I can say that um, I started really getting into other bands after that, but Kiss was like the doorway, it was the gateway, it was the gateway drug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the rock music, you know, it really was. And, and, and I was like, this is, this is, and I couldn't imagine my life without that. Um, as the years went by, like I was, I was, um, I stuck to Kiss in the late seventies and the early eighties. But when they started jettisoning, like they jettisoned uh, Paul and they jettisoned, I mean, not Paul, Paul Peter. When they jettisoned Peter and Ace, I was like, well, uh, for me, like um, I thought that's how I thought of Kiss as the original lineup. And when when they uh, when those guys left, um, it wasn't the same for me. And I was like. I was resentful. I was like, well, that's not my kiss. That's mm -hmm. not the real kiss. I did that for many years, actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I did get into that. The, the 80s kiss, 90s kiss, I got into that. Uh, after the fact, I guess you could say somewhat somewhat after the fact. But, um, you know, the, the, that, that era of my life is really where kiss, like I think of kiss um, as being a time and a place in my life. Um, and... Um, you know, they were they were a part of that for sure and awesome. uh, you know irreplaceable Irre you know of there course. was no substitute of course <laughs> now i realize it's a little cliche you know when two people with a kiss shirt walk by each other we we wave hey how's it going it's like we're yes. best friends you know but it makes sense because you know kiss fans have so much things in common music or interest in music in books in movies we like sci-fi we like horror you know so, you know, yes. you, like you, you like horror as well. And you wrote this, oh, yeah. this book, The 13 Story uh, Asylum. Now, yes. I'm curious. Now, your stories explore, you know, themes of darkness and the human psyche. So what specifically draws you to those particular themes? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that is that is an excellent question. Why? Why do I want to explore that dark side of humanity? And... I think um, I, I I just um, I want to like it's really weird because I, I I think of the world generally speaking the world is generally an okay place I don't I don't believe in anything supernatural I don't I, I'm more of a science person to be honest and um, I think that like. I, I'm always saying to myself, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? I was never a person that said, um, isn't it cool that something's happening? It's like, wouldn't it be cool if mm. whatever happened? You know, so uh, immediately my muse was not, it's, it's not a dramatic muse. It's, it's a horror 
it's a horror muse. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I can look at a room and, and say, and, and like, there's a closed door. I'm going to think there's something scary behind that door in my mind, in my imagination, when I'm writing, I want something scary to be behind that door. Not that there is necessarily anything scary behind any door of any room that I've been in. But when I'm in, when I'm writing, I want there to be something scary behind that door. And, um, and it's almost like, I don't know, like I read an interview with Stephen King where somebody was saying, Ma, you must have some really messed up uh, like nightmares. And his quote is, I dream, I dream the dreams of a man who gets his nightmares out during the day. And mm. like, that's to me, <laughs> that's pretty much sums up. You know, it's like, I, I sleep good. well, I sleep fine at night. I, but <laughs> it's, it's because I'm, it's because I'm getting this stuff and I don't know, maybe it is, it's just, I wrestle with demons during the day. These like, um, uh, imagine uh, the, just the, the, the these, these, uh, I don't know how to put it. Like just, just ideas, just really dark, um, scary ideas during the day. I like doing it. It's, I don't know. It's weird. It's like, almost like, it's like a hobby or something, you know, it's, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because instead of collecting stamps, I collect these, really strange stories in my head you know okay. <laughs> and, and, and I, you know um and it's 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 nice though to get them out on the paper because like that's a, the final thing is like these I, I get scared by these notions um you know in the 13 story asylum um i do have like all those stories um i wrote in the in the span of about a year and a half you know two years which um I wrote uh, another one called 12 Story Asylum, which is like, it's not really a prequel. It's just 12 other stories. But those stories were written over the course of like, I want to say 20 years. And I put that, I put that collection out. And then this one, I just, I just like banged out these, these stories. And they were all the result of like a lot of, a lot of things happened. Like the, uh, the pandemic happened, which was an inspiration for a story. And then I would read, uh, act things that were actually going on, which would, you know, um, kind of inspire me to write other stories. And, and then, like at that time, I, I became enamored of. Um, I, I like science. I think science is pretty cool. But I was reading Carl Sagan and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I was reading these guys, and and that 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 inspired some other stories um, in there. Um, but it was all like um, I would read something that was happening and then I immediately go to what if the reason why it's happening is something really horrible or scary or from outer space, <laughs> you know, something like well, you that. You have the tendency just, to go there, right? I have, I have the tendency to go there and I don't know, I'm shock value. I don't, um, I don't know. I don't think so. I think I just really, um, I just ha- have a head that comes up with um, some strange things, you know, reality goes, goes in but like horror comes out you know <laughs> right 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 what, you, what am i gonna do you know it's the it's the fate of carl but it's interesting that you use the asylum setting because in a sense the scariest thing is the human mind and it's scary to imagine what we are capable of so oh, um, yeah. is that why you 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 use the setting of an asylum in your stories he, um well, I mean that that's a really good question because um it makes me think the the reason why I, I came up with the asylum uh setting well at least as far as the title goes I did want to I I did want to put forth the like if this was a TV show like Tales from the Crypt. Mm-hmm. You know, you enter on the ground floor. Here's this story, then you go up to the second floor. Here's the next story. And it's, of course, it's, you know, it's a play on, it's a play on words, you know, uh, 12 store, a, a story is also a floor um, in like construction, you know, there's a 40 story building, it's, you know, 40 floors, basically. So, but, a, you know, the story is also like a short story. Mm, so, right. Um, nice. And, and I, I, and I envisioned it as like, if this was like a TV show, all these stories would be in this building, you know, it would be in this, uh, but I see asylum 
uh, asylum has many meanings for me, but the core meaning, the one that's most important for me is uh, asylum is, is a safe place. It's a, a place where you can go. Like there are people who seek asylum, you know, like uh, you're mm. looking for a place where you can be safe. And I always found myself when I was reading, when I, you know, especially like that book, I told you, uh, Night Shift by Stephen King, like I, I just felt like time, time stood still and I was just in, in, in this world. I was, I'd been, you know, um, uh, just what whatever you want to call it, um, you know, transmitted to this uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. other world. And, you know, a part of me was just there, but it was like, I felt like I was doing something that um, I was, I was meant to be doing. And in that sense, you know, I felt like I was sheltered. I felt like, um, you know, this is a place where I belong. Yeah, safe. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it, oddly enough, I'm reading all these horror stories, but um, uh, uh, Asylum to me does mean that. Um, it, it, it means uh, in, in, in terms of this book, and I know like an asylum can also be like a, a prison or a mental asylum or something like right. that. It, it's been used that way. So there's a, there's a little turn of phrase this. There's a creepy element to it. Um, but um, I, I like to go deeper than that also, you know, uh, just go deeper in, into that, the ultimate meaning of life, uh, you know. But, uh, if you like this stuff and if you're a big fan of horror, you'll feel, uh, you feel like you belong here and, you know, it's a good place really to interesting. be. Really, 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 really interesting. Yeah. And, you know, Carl, so you yeah. mentioned before that actually your book, it's kind of a collection of, of short stories. Sure. You know, you... You basically sure. did the analogy of going, you know, up the up the stairs, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you would you believe that um, writing a collection of, of of stories with with a particular theme, it's more difficult than writing a full novel? Hmm. Um. I. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't tried my hand at a novel. I've written some long short stories, which okay. could be considered novellas. Yeah. Um, but for me, for me personally, I think at this stage where I'm at right now as a writer, it feels um, easier for me. I guess you could Natural. say to right. yeah. to write to write stories, to write short stories. And I mean, as far as a common theme goes. That that's interesting too. I had a friend uh, come up to me and say, "Have you ever thought of like writing a, a book like this with short stories in it? But like maybe you have a like not a main character, but like a supporting character who's like in the background that shows up in each one of the mm -hmm. stories." I thought that was mm -hmm. pretty funny. You know, it's a mm -hmm. funny idea. Mm -hmm. Like they all take place in a universe where this character exists and just. Like maybe he's uh, you know delivering a pizza in one story, and maybe he's a cashier in another, but but not a main character, you know, just someone that that right. that, that uh, goes in the background and right. maybe has like something happened to him in the last story. I don't know, uh, but um, that uh, I th I think like where I'm at right now, it does feel um, easier. I haven't tackled the the a novel novel and. Um, it seems to me like um, it would be a lot of work unless like I, I just, I've written some long stories where I was like genuinely inspired and I just kept going and going and going and going. And I'm like, wow, this is really blossoming into something here like this. This is it's like uh, it was exploding. You know, mm -hmm. it was a store uh, began as an idea, but now it's like, you know, I'm getting into like usually my stories around 10 pages, 20 pages. But this one is like 40, 50 pages. And I'm like, oh, all right, I can see like if I was inspired enough, I could probably do a novel. But I, I would um, I would get okay. some help with it uh, okay, as far as editing, as far as editing goes. You know, it's hard right. to keep track. There's a lot of words in a novel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just wanted to know. OK, mm -hmm. OK. But Carl, you're also um, a screenwriter. And in a sense, that's like mm -hmm. writing um, a full novel. So would you say that's an extension? Mm -hmm of being an author? Mm, yes, that, that's a good point. Um, and uh, where, where screenwriting fits in for me is like a novel, uh, a novel really can be just an indefinite number of pages. Um, you know, it's, uh, it could be 150 pages, it could be a thousand pages, you know, um, whereas a screenplay for me is a set number 
like I think when I think of a screenplay, I think of a work that's 110 pages long, and it's uh, you know, they're ve there's ve it's very sort of sparse with the direct with description. It it's it, very bare, you know, mm -hmm. bare bones description. You don't get into like what do you call it there, um, flowery language. Right. with um mm -hmm. descriptions in a screenplay uh, it's just you gotta it's there's it's about the economy of words and i i like that i like how you have to be a uh, brief you have to be brief in a screenplay in every sense of the word um and uh even if you're going to see a quentin tarantino movie where there's pages and pages of dialogue but still he's he knows when to get out of a scene he knows when to enter a scene and leave a scene and it's, you know, it's never really like that long, you know, and it, and if you look at if sit down and watch any of your favorite movies, watch like how, how, how long the scenes are and what and what the scenes do. Um, every every scene, every line, you know, every every everything is is is, is put in there to propel a plot to character development. You know, there's not, there isn't anything, anything really wasteful going on, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is like, I think a, um, an author who has a great style, everyone from Charles Dickens to Stephen King, they can sit in a room, they can have a, a scene take a, a 50 page chapter take place in a room. And, you know, Stephen King, he's, he, he can make uh, grass growing. This is my joke about Stephen King. He can make grass growing seem scary. Yeah. But once you film it, it's not as scary. That's why I think a lot of his movies, a lot of his movies, they, they try to adapt them, but you're trying to adapt a, a, a style that is very effective and very scary. But, he, you know, he can describe anything, you know, with the, make, make a butterfly scary, you know, but um, uh, I, I, I think there's an economy in which a, a screenplay is almost like a haiku. It, you know, mm. it has to obey um, specific, um, uh, elements, you know, uh, specific rules. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do appreciate like some of the, some of the movies that I've seen where the, the writers and directors are taking chances. Um, I really love these new, this, the, these new directors, um, uh, you know, Yorgos Lanthimos and uh, the, uh, the guy who did the Denis Vianev. Um, these guys are, um, you know, great, uh, like, like breaking through walls, they're breaking through barriers. Yeah. yeah. But still, you can't expect to have somebody sit in a movie seat for like nine hours or whatever. There's got to be some kind of like economy. Uh, of her, and I and I appreciate with with that with screenplays. But that being said, a screenplay is is longer than uh, definitely a lot longer than a short story. But I think what what happens in the script is I can see how it plays out, and I see the beginning, the middle, the end. You know there is a three act structure. There's there's uh, uh, um, an arc. There's an arc for the audience. Mm -hmm. There are arcs for the characters. But there's an arc for the audience. There's a feeling at the end that um, you know you 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 feel like you had a good time. First of all, you didn't waste your money, and then maybe you got a little bit of uh, wisdom slipped into your back pocket or something, or maybe you're comforted. Maybe something upset you, and you're not upset anymore. Uh, a movie mm -hmm. can do all those things, but it has sure. to do it quickly. It really does. Mm. Uh, you know, especially like horror movies. Um, I don't know, like, I can't think of any like movie that was over, although I understand Terrifier, those Terrifier movies are pretty long. They're like two and a half hours long. But I mean, I can't imagine a horror movie being longer than that because yeah. that's asking a lot uh, for an audience. To be Attention. scared for that. Yeah. It's just exhausting. Yeah, yeah. It's just exhausting. But, you know? but having said that, you know, still mm -hmm. right in Detroit Rock City was a departure from you, uh, for you, for, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it was, was a departure. If you look at the my work, especially if you IMDB me, you'll see that uh, most of my work is horror. Yeah. And, um, I take these little left turns into comedy every once in a while. Uh, I was going back through my mind of like, I was like, what was my early sort of resume like? And when I started out writing, I tried a little bit of this and a little bit of that. 
I tried action. I tried a romantic comedy. I, I tried, um, you know, what else? Uh, like, uh, um, I tried science fiction, you know, flat out science fiction. And, and I, I wrote this horror script early on. It was one of my, oh, I wrote a pirate movie. Mm. It was like a pirate comedy. It was like airplane, but with pirates. Um, but um, I wrote this, uh, it's a creature horror story. And it actually opened a lot of doors for me um, as, as far as just, you know, as a calling card, like, oh, this guy can write a screenplay. But it was also like, hey, this guy would be good to write horror screenplays. Mm -hmm. So it was called, it was called uh, Roadkill. And it, it was kind of like a homage to Aliens, you know, the a alien movies, basically, mm -hmm. but, but here on Earth. And um, it's kind of like that. Um, but it, uh, it got a lot of people's attention and there were, there were horror producers and the people who like sort of latched onto it the most are, um, the people over at, uh, Dimension, uh, which that was part of Miramax at the time it handled, it did the screen movies, the early screen movies. And, um, I was actually working on, uh, screen two. Um, with uh, Wes Craven and um, his editor, Patrick Lussier, who's a, a great director also. Um, but I, I finished the script. I'm like, hey, you know, that's one thing working in the cutting room did for me was it gave me access. I used to be a PA a long, long time ago, production assistant. And I, I, you, know, you don't get a chance to talk to anybody if you're a production assistant. You know, when you're, a, when you're in the editing room, everybody comes in there, the producers, the director the dp and if you have any questions about anything you can like they're sitting around half the time waiting for the editor to finish so you can kind of like pick their brain you know you can just you know see what kind of coffee they like <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> i don't know but you can strike up conversations with these people and you're in you're in the proper setting you're not in a setting where um they need to get like uh you know what well, we need to get this shot so you're not like annoying basically but um as an assistant editor on screen two, um, you know, I, uh, I gave this script to uh, Patrick Lussier and he was due to direct um, uh, the next in a, uh, the Prophecy movies, which would, uh, the Prophecy was a series of movies featuring uh, Christopher Walken as the angel Gabriel. Yeah. And I mean, he passed this um, script along to um, the production company and they really, they really liked it a lot. And they're like, Hey, you know, this is, you can do creature horror. That's, you know, it's like kind of a genre in itself. That's really tough to do. It's tough. Well, I mean, it's, how can I put it? It's like tough to surprise people and, and make it interesting um, because everything's been sort of done, uh, done to death, no pun intended, you know? Um, so that led me into that. It was like a, a reward thing that happened with that, with that um, work. And so, so on the one hand, I was being hired, I worked on a couple of Hellraiser movies also, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Pinhead and all that. And um, I was also, I, I just, I wrote my own, um, I wrote my own horror scripts. I eventually wound up having a movie produced, um, independent horror film called Incubus uh, with, uh, you know, Freddy Krueger himself there. Ro yeah. Robert Anglin was in that, you know, that was very cool. Um, but I just seemed to gravitate toward the, uh, Fort Horror after that. And, and of course, Detroit Rock City, that was another experience where, you know, I had a positive, I had a positive experience in terms of people reading a script and liking it a lot. Um, and I do like, I think comedy and horror have a lot in common. You know, there's, there's, they, they both, they're like different sides of the same coin for me, comedy and horror. Um, they're like, just boil it down to the element of surprise. You know, when you, when you surprise someone, you're either going to scare them or you're going to make them laugh or maybe sometimes both. But you know what I mean? Uh, uh, I, I was still I was still kind of like, uh, I don't know. I, I've always found it easier to write about things that scare me um, and maybe punch it up with a little comedy. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just started watching this uh, Return of the Living Dead. I don't know if you guys oh, are familiar yeah. with that. Of course. 1985. Yeah. Yeah. of course. But comedy and horror, you know, comedy, yeah. horror. Yeah. The movie's Penny uh, Hand. Yeah. Brian De Palma. He did a lot of that in his movies. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you're laughing one minute and you're terrified the next, and it's it sure. works. They 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 go in hand in hand. But I like the the couching everything in the horror genre, and then you know you can do anything. You can you can have a love story happen. You know, you can have your romantic comedy with a uh, horror also, or you can have an action movie. Uh, you know, Aliens. Um, um, a lot of people would say that that's more of an action movie, but there's a horror. There's a big horror element to that. So, well, you know, but but anyway, uh, I I do feel like um, what happened with Detroit Rock City was like a one-off thing in so many different ways. I can't even describe to you uh, how I was almost like uh, I was almost like browbeaten into writing this script. Um, it really was, uh, it was its own thing. Um, you know, I was, I, at the time I was working for another editor. I mean, if you don't mind me telling this story real quick, I'll try to give you the reader, Reader's Digest version. But I was working with an editor who was like one of the biggest KISS fans I've ever met in my life. This guy owned a KISS pinball machine. I don't know if that's a, uh, uh, no, Pat just has his uh, picture hanging up back there. But this guy, you know, the, 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 he had a room that looked like the, the rooms that you guys are in right now. He had rooms like that in his house. And he was just crazy about KISS. And um, I and and uh, I we used to trade stories about Kiss concerts and you know Kiss records blah blah blah. And at one point I I said to because we were both fans of that movie um, I want to hold your hand, mm-hmm. um, which is an early Robert Zemeckis movie about uh, four girls going to see the Beatles at the Ed the Ed Sullivan show. And it's just hilarious. It's it's a really fun, and I like the way it bounced back and forth between the four main characters. And I I said somebody's got to do a movie like that, but with Kiss is the holy grail. And I and and he was like, oh, I want to see that on my desk on Monday. Uh-huh. And, and that was his joke. <laughs> that was his joke because I was like the writer of the of the cutting room. I was the writer, so he's always saying, yeah, I want to see that on my desk on Monday, because he said that's what I'm. Uh, you know, that's what I'm probably going to um, have people saying to me if I keep writing. Um, but um, we wound up working on this movie called uh, The Stoned Age, which is about, um, you know, part, kids going and partying in the 70s. There's a little day, it's kind of like a dazed and confused tone to it um, pro- before days, or maybe right about the same time as Days and Confused. But it was really, it, it was a nice little it was a nice movie. It was a, you know, like indie comedy. And it was, and the, the characters like Blue Oyster Cult, which is pretty funny. Um, uh, <laughs> and they were taught, they were talking about the Blue Oyster Cult. And the director, his name's James Malconian. Um, a- after we wrapped on that movie, a few months later, Peter Schenk, the editor, um, invites me to lunch. And he says, oh, James Malconian's going to be there. Uh, and I was like, oh, great. Yeah, that sounds, you know. So I went out to lunch, and in the middle of this lunch, he says to, to James, oh, uh, Carl's working on a, a script about a bunch of kids to go see a Kiss concert. And at that point, I had like get, long given up on this idea. I didn't even tell Pete that. I was like, like I thought that, well, I want to see that on my desk. On my, I thought it was like kind of a joke anyway. And I attempted to, to start working on it. like, eh, I don't know. I tried a bunch of different things, and, and it was basically in limbo in my brain. It was a something that I, I started and I was convinced that I was never going to finish it. So here he is telling James Malconian that I'm working on a script. He's going, oh, that sounds really interesting. So I got this movie director. He's like actually directed a movie and he's interested in seeing my script. And it felt like I was like on the ground floor of something. So I was like, oh, yeah, 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 uh, totally. Yeah, I'm writing this script. Uh, it's really cool. It's about kids <laughs> going to see a kiss. Con- and, he goes, and he goes, how far away are you from, from finishing it? And of course... He shake answers for me. And he goes, oh, yeah, Carl's going to be done in a few weeks, right, Carl? You're going to be done, what, four weeks, six weeks? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be done in four weeks. So I had, I ran home, and luckily I wasn't working at the time. That's the way, uh, um, if you're a movie editor, you go from job to job, and sometimes you have breaks that, you know, you just basically you got to be, you got to have money saved up to get you through like the times when you're not working or else, uh, you know, unemployment, whatever. But um, I had that break and I was like, all right, I'm really going to jam on this. And I finished it and I, um, 
I like I rewatched um, I want to hold your hand. I'm writing down the, the scenes and I want to throw them that away. I, it was it was crazy. It was it, it was nuts. But I wound up finishing this script and I got it to a good point. And then I gave it to him. And you know what? He read it like over the course of a weekend. And he, I gave it to him on a Friday. He called me back on Monday. He was like, hey, this is a really good script. Like, I'm like, wow. I'm like, thanks. Thanks. That says, that's great. He goes, he goes, what does Kiss think of it? <laughs> and um, I, I said, um, well, Kiss hasn't read it. He goes, he goes, they haven't. Have you, have you submitted it to them? I said, no, I don't. I don't know Kiss. He goes, oh, good luck then. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Like I gave, I, I, I put this known entity in my script. I have a known thing in my script and now I have no way to get it to them. And I immediately just started kicking myself. I said, I'm never doing that again. I'm never putting another brand name in any of my scripts. Cause like I didn't, I didn't have any, any access to Kiss at all. And, um, but that was like, I don't know, it like disappeared for, it went in my desk drawer for about a year and a half. And then um, I worked on this uh, movie called Barbed Wire with mm -hmm. Am Anderson. And, um, and it was a huge cutting room. And I met this uh, other guy uh, named David Feldman. And we were two, we were, we were like, you know, young filmmakers. We're, we're going to make it in the business. Uh, you know, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on a short film. What are you working on? Like I'm talking about everybody in the cutting room is like that. And me and me and David exchanged this. Like he said, Oh, um, you know, I'm 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 trying to get a uh, production company going and I'm I've got these short films I want to make and sell them and see. and and he said, What do you have to I said, Well, I just want to write and I well, I wanted to direct, of course, because it's Hollywood, everybody wants to direct, but I but I was writing at the time and I told him I, I wrote a, a movie about a bunch of kids going to see a kiss concert. And he happened to be friends with this uh, actor, uh, Kevin Corrigan, um, who's like an indie actor, but was like, he was in Goodfellas and he was in a few other things. And he's been in a few things since, but um, he wanted to play Ace Freely in the Ace Freely story. So he was like, he was a big Kiss fan. So David gives this script to Kevin and then it goes through this, like, I, I mean, it was like a pinball. It went to another person and another person and another person. And it turns out that that, that guy, Kevin's uh, manager, knew a casting director who wanted to become a producer. And she was meeting, she was having lunch with uh, a dude named Barry Levine, who shot yeah. the Kiss Alive 2 um, program. Okay. He shot the pictures for that. And so I get this call. I get, uh, the, 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 the script is... Uh, I, I gave I gave the, the script to whatever David Feldman on a Friday, and then the next Monday, I get a call from this guy Barry Levine, and by this time the, 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 I was being like, oh, so and so likes it, this guy likes it, that lady likes it, this pretty and he, and he called there because he goes, hey, uh, hey, uh, Gene really likes the script, and I'm like, <laughs> all right, what? Gene, Gene, who's that? Who's Gene? He goes, Gene Simmons. And I'm like, holy, I, you could have like peeled me off the ceiling when I heard that. Cause I, I was losing track of all the people that were involved in this. And, and, and apparently Barry Levine read this script on the plane to London when he shot uh, Kiss for their, when they got back into the makeup and he gave it to Doc McGee, who's Kiss's manager. And um, the minute he got off the plane and I mean, you know, it was just, it was just incredible how, and Kiss, happened to be in talks with New Line Cinema to do a movie and they were they had been sitting through pitch meetings and there was these uh story development people who were racking their brains and they got this script on their desk and like oh this is it this is the script <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. <laughs> and it, came, it came in it came in from the outside you know and it was like all right this is it and um uh, I mean it, it was just like it was one of these they called it kiss met you know what I mean um, you know, because it was like one of these things where just all, all the stars just kind of came into a line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, but it was just a really unique experience for me, and I think that's why it's like such an outlier tone wise for me. You know, just straight comedy. But it was because um, it was a script that I would not have finished on my own. I would, I would, I, it was all 
these outside influences influences that got me to finish it. So, yeah, you were under pressure. So then, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny though. Yeah, but I yeah, I had another story I did called it was uh, called the King and Me, and it was about uh, Elvis uh, being put up put with this FBI agent partnering up with this FBI, and it was like a buddy a buddy cop movie, but with an you know crusty old FBI agent and Elvis Presley as his partner it was called the King and Me. And I immediately scrapped it because I said, I don't know how to get this to Elvis's people. I, <laughs> I, I, don't, know. I don't have any connection to Elvis's estate. Hey, Carl, but, I, um, you know, it's it's clear that uh, basically when, when you when you got into writing the script, basically you you wanted to to uh, kind of make it a movie uh, about a fan's obsession, you know, to, to mm -hmm. go and see their band. So you never thought of coming up with a Kiss movie and telling the story of the band and all of that. So um, so that leads me to the next question. So how did you collaborate with the, uh, with the director, with uh, Adam Rifkin, uh, to bring the script to life? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, well, uh, Adam was a huge help. And, um, there was another movie that I worked on during this time called The Chase with uh, Charlie Sheen that Adam directed. And I was picking Adam's brain about mainly, um, you know, what, what, like, what did he remember about the seventies? I was trying to look for the right tone for this. Mm. And, you know, we get into these little conversations of like, oh, this is big in the, the subject, like mood rings were big in the seventies. Oh, Stretch Armstrong. That's like, and, and you know, he, he gave me advice on how to, you know, go back and and and, and um, jog my own memories of that uh, that period of my life, and um, so he was there, like in the formative stages, I want to say, of you know uh, the writing of the script, and uh, then once he was attached to direct the script. Um, he was like, he was the connection to KISS and like he had those ideas of uh, putting like the, the backstage stuff of, you know, when uh, when Lex is attempting to get into, um, he's, he's like, uh, craw you know, he, he's crawling over like the, the, the vents of, uh, uh, you know, backstage there and there's like the hot tub and there's, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like the group. <laughs> the groupies and all that yeah, yeah, yeah. and um you know like that that kind of stuff uh and and it, that was like a lot, a lot of communication with um with the band too with gene and paul and them um and he was also um and i know he'd get mad at me for saying this but he he let the the actors ad lib a few things here and there most i, I mean i was very lucky that you know the, the movie was greenlit so fast that they couldn't really make any structural changes to it, any big changes. So like, that's my name. Uh, you know, I, I earned that sole writing credit in a way because um, they didn't really change all that much, but he had the actors uh, improvise things. And I really do think like, they came up with some really good lines. Okay. You know, they came up with some really funny things. Um, but he was like, he was like, I want you to take credit for everything. You take credit for all those those, those lines. Don't let anybody. And I was like, yeah, all right, all right. But he <laughs> it, it, and he he also direct. He had this really great directorial uh, style that was a combination between like he reminded me of of you know Sam Raimi or the Coen Brothers, uh, flying the camera flying all over the place, but also capturing I think like uh, in a lot of ways just the way the 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 shots are 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 you know. Uh, the shots are set up and the look of the, the the colors, I guess, what am I trying to say? Like the film type, it looked like it was from the seventies, yeah, you know? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it looked like an ABC after school special, but it, <laughs> it, was, it was supposed to look that way. You know, it was like, yeah, it, it yeah. Was supposed to have that nostalgia. It was, it, it, and, and I really enjoyed that, that quite a bit too. Um, so in terms of collaborating, um, he, his was, he brought a lot, to the visual experience. And he also, you know, yeah, um, involved Kiss more. Kiss was just, uh, let me see. Um, there was, a, the original version of the script is just them entering Kobo Hall at the end. You don't even see Kiss playing, you know? So, um, I mean, eventually I added that, that, 
that in there. And I can't remember, I think I took it out. And then, but he was, he said to me, he was like, do you think the kids should see the band at the end? Don't you know? He said, don't you think the kids? And I said, oh yeah, I wrote, I, I have that. I wrote that scene like at one of the drafts and I got it and I, I faxed it to him and he didn't change it at all. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. The only thing he changed was like, um, jam through his drum set, drum stick to Peter yeah. Chris, not right. the other way around. So Peter Chris throws it to just, uh, you know, it's like, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I think everything worked really well. It worked for the best. It's a good movie. It's my kind of movie. I like it. So there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Carl, you know, you know, as I was watching the movie, I asked myself, or I told myself, you know, you couldn't write a script like that without being a Kiss fan. But, you know, you, you're not a hardcore Kiss fan, yet you sort of captured the spirit of the Kiss fandom. Now, was that by accident or by design? Um, well, I got a lot of help um, that uh, Peter Shank uh, wound up cutting Detroit Rock City, the, the guy who inspired me. <laughs> to write it and i was always picking his brain and then uh one of the producers tim sullivan he's like the maybe he's the biggest kiss fan i've ever met in my life he could be the biggest kiss fan i've ever met mm -hmm. um but he was um he him pete and to some extent adam also uh they they were the ones that kind of got together with the production designers and all that and gave the Gave it like the visual, the, the feel, uh, you know, dress the kids up and all that. Um, but I mean, when I when I went back to my own, um, my experiences as, well, I mean, a, mu a fan of music, just a fan of music. Um, and to, to specifically Kiss, um, I just remember those conversations that I had with my peers. And, you know, Detroit Rock City ultimately is about how great it was for me this is this is my own this is my own personal like sort of takeaway from it. the story there was something really exciting when you when, when you, you bought the tickets and it, there was no ticket tron there was no that you'd go to whatever you go i like i remember buying tickets at this record store um down the street from my house and there would always be a long line of people waiting and the people who, like depending on the band there were people who would go they do shifts. Somebody go wait there at midnight. Who's going to do in the midnight to three shift? Mm -hmm. And then somebody go at three and take that person's place so they could go home and sleep and save their place in line and um, you get your tickets. All right. Then there was a the day of the concert. It's fine. It's like, it's, not, it's almost like these tickets came alive in your pocket. You know, it's almost like, it's like, wow, like there's something in the air, you know? And, and that for me was like, it was just the excitement. Like today's the day we're going to go see Kiss. And, um, you know, we've had these tickets for a while, but, and that's what started the whole thing of, uh, you know, uh, Jam's mom burning the tickets, down right. thinking they won the tickets and going all the way up there. And, um, you know, it was, it's, it's just all about that atmosphere, that kinetic uh, atmosphere of like, we're going to see this concert. And I know it's like, it's, it's something that's tough to um, describe because I think that, I mean, when I think of arena rock today, you're, you're thinking whatever Taylor Swift, I guess, is, uh, uh, <laughs> not not really rock, but just an arena performer. You know, you, you don't really have these. Uh, I mean, I saw Guns N' Roses at um, the Gillette Center, which is a pretty big arena. That was that, and that was back in what was it, 2017, I think. That was a great show. That was awesome, and it brought me back to uh, you know my childhood once again you know mm -hmm. um and um but but that it felt like a time in my life where you know it's um i don't know maybe like I, not, not the kids don't go see concerts anymore i just don't think it's the same mm -hmm. now it's different. Um, yeah big time yeah. And, and i think especially so you youtube and social media yeah um yeah. you felt like when you went to see these concerts, you really did feel like a friend of mine used to say, it was like seeing the gods come down from Olympus to grace us, yeah, you know, with yeah. their godliness, you know? Um, and that's what it did seem like, you know, I remember him saying that, like, I, I geez, what was it? Uh, I went to see like the police or something and I'm, and, and 
this guy was just saying it was like wow it's like you know it's like seeing the gods come down from olympus mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and i think and, and and i think that's been sort of um well although my daughter does talk about taylor swift uh, uh you know in certain terms that i think she might understand but but still it's like it's like a, it's it's an element of of at least you know my, my childhood that like I, I would have a tough time describing that to somebody else but if you watch detroit rock city maybe hopefully you get that concept you know and i think the the fact that kiss isn't in, in it that much makes it all the more special at the end when you really get that payoff oh, yeah. exactly. you get that ending you know and it's like yeah we did it you know we we yeah. we, we saw we saw the gods yeah so car this is really really interesting what you mentioned uh you know and uh how you how you wanted to kind of show and uh, the, the kind of message that, that you wanted to send, you know, with, with the movie, you know, kind of transpire you to the 70s. So how, how did you ensure that the film's portrayal of Kiss was authentic and respectful to the band's legacy? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was, I was very careful about... Um, you know, a movie like this, a movie like this, you could take any band and you could take any fandom. You could even take, I, from what I understand, they have a Star Wars movie where it's a bunch of kids going to see a screening of the Phantom Menace, I guess. Yeah. And it's supposedly like, like, uh, what do you call it? It's supposedly like Detroit Rock City. Right. You know, um, but it's, it's Star Wars. I don't know. I think that, um, the important part, the most important part for me was I started out by uh, seeing those fans as they were like friends of mine from high school, you know, and they're people I hung out with. And I wasn't, I, I was trying to portray the fans in a respectful manner first. I think that was mm -hmm. like, that was how like, and, and it's a natural thing to want to do with screenwriting too. Um, I can understand the temptation of taking uh, you know, do spinal tapping it out and and making it sort of a parody. No, but do spinal tap only the fans. You know, you're you're making fun of a group of people for liking something. Mm -hmm. um, but I really, I wanted to dig into just the psychology, psyche. Like when you're a kid, you really are looking for that voice. You're looking, and rock, that's what rock and roll did. For my youth, it got me, rock and roll got me through adolescence, you know, Kiss, The Who, Pink Floyd, they, they got me through adolescence. I found comfort as I uh -huh. was, as I was growing into adulthood, like, oh, other people have been through this stuff too, you know, it's like reading, uh, I, uh, getting back to my daughter, one of my daughter's favorite books, but The Outsiders, I don't know yeah. if you're familiar with that, yeah, I know absolutely. you're probably familiar with The, 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 the Outsiders is a great book um for that kind of thing where you're like oh okay i'm not going crazy here i'm not a crazy person <laughs> that's right there yeah. are other people who feel this way <laughs> True. And it's really important and 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 that was a good thing that rock did and i know rock was, you know you could get cynical and say well they were just making those songs to sell records to kids but hey you know what they were delivering a message to kids yeah you know yeah. and they were, and the message was it's okay you know it's all right you're gonna be you're gonna be good and uh, and like all those things that you really loved or that you want to hear from adults uh, to some extent of like, uh, you know, live for today, you know, a rock and roll all night party every day. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and just celebrate, celebrate life. And I mean, uh, and just know that what you're going through, other people have gone through. So, you know, you're not alone. And That's there was crazy. this, this, uh, this kind of sense of, belonging right so you you know this this it's, common thing with people so that uh, basically unites you know so that's that's it, the beauty of rock and roll yeah yeah and and so in that sense it pretty it was easy to treat with uh kiss with the reverence you know and the respect that they i think they deserved and and they earned for being being there for us mm -hmm. you know i felt like that i felt like kiss was there um for their fans when their fans were young and you know, it's just uh, true. It was, uh, the, and that, that's that's pretty much why I, you know, mm -hmm. how I handle all that. You know? 
So, uh, uh, Carl, before we ask you the next the next question, so I'm I'm curious to know, uh, Pask, what, what did you get out of uh, Detroit Rock City? What, what are your thoughts about the movie? Listen, I'm not just saying this because Carl's here. I honestly loved the movie. I saw it twice in the theaters, bought it on DVD, and watched <laughs> it countless times at home. Now, I didn't I didn't go into the movie expecting a kiss movie. I went in expecting a movie about KISS fans. And I think that's why I like it so much. Because, Claudia, we said it a thousand times, right? KISS is about us. It's about the community. Mm -hmm. And it, mm -hmm. it, it, KISS afforded us opportunities for once-in-a-lifetime experiences with people around the world. And this movie, I found, was a reflection of that. And, you know, being my age, uh, watching that movie <laughs> brought back memories uh, oh, yeah. of the uh, of the 70s, of the excitement of seeing Kiss on magazines. There was no internet then. Uh, seeing Kiss on television. I mean, seeing Kiss meets the Phantom for the first time, you know? So yes. I remember I remember those feelings I had as a kid and the movie brought back those feelings. So my, awesome. favorite, my favorite scene in the movie is when they arrive in Detroit and you see and you see the stadium and you see the oh, fans yeah. and oh yeah. my god mm. just thinking about it brings back uh, brings back goosebumps you know it, it it really captured the spirit of what it means to be a kiss fan yeah. the movie was fantastic for that amazing so how could a, how could a, i was about to say how can a kiss fan not like it no how can a music fan not like it because mm -hmm. you don't have to be a kiss fan to enjoy this movie that's Just right. have an enjoyment of music, you would definitely enjoy Detroit Rock City. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thank you very much uh, for saying that because that's what that's what it was about for me. And I've had conversations uh, where um, Kiss was a community, and I mean, yeah, I love your you know the, the Kiss Army and all that. that that's that's just great. That, I mean, and and it, it is. Um, I tried to, I tried to get that across. Um, in the movie also, the phenomenon, you know, not just the, like the band, but like the effect that they had on all these other people, you know. Um, and I mean, I love like, you know, the, those little touches, uh, the kid with the Ace Freely makeup yeah. and all that stuff, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and just how many people. And yeah, and, and that footage, when they get to Cobo Hall, that the, the establishing shots of the people going to see the concert, I thought they did just such a wonderful job with all that and creating that or recreating that sense of, uh, you know, it, it really was, it was, it, it was, um, and I mean, yeah, you could say that you could say it about any band at all. You could say that mm -hmm. about Aerosmith or yes, or whatever you can say that, Oh yeah, everybody's gone and they got their yes t-shirts, <laughs> but, but with kiss, there really was something special there. Um, yeah, they did cultivate, they cultivated something extra that, um, and you know, uh, Gene Simmons gets made fun of sometimes for the, the whole merchandising aspect of it. But like, look at the rooms that you're in. I mean, that's 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 awesome, man. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And I mean, I got um, I got my Kiss Army jacket. It's a leather jacket that I got as a result of uh, Detroit Rock City. Um, and um, I was thinking of hanging it up behind me, but I, I was I said like, maybe this will be enough. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it's great, yeah, you know. But 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 uh, just to kiss army alone, like I remember seeing that stuff in the backs of comic books and whatnot, you know, the, which I'm sure was a thrill for them. And and you can tell like they were they were they they weren't like they were just as thrilled to have all these people, um, you know, and they were appreciative of that and um that was part of the, the the kiss phenomenon the kiss community is that you felt like there there's a two-way thing going on they, they, they weren't aloof or anything like that they were cool guys you didn't know what they looked like in real life but what, you know what the hell is it like it was just uh and it still is it still is a, a great sense of you know of belonging like like yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so claudia what are your thoughts Oh, I love the movie. I really do. And, you know, same as, as you said before, to me, that I, I never had the chance to see Kiss live in the 70s, um, not even in the 80s. Uh, I, I, I always fantasized, you know, what, uh, what must have been like, you know, to, to go to a Kiss show in the 70s. And actually, um, 
uh, you know, that was a fantastic script, I have to say, Carl, because you actually achieved what you wanted. So it's it's a life experience. Uh, it's, you know, just by getting the tickets, you know, uh, uh, you know, hiding or running away from parents, you know, being the outcast <laughs> at, at school, um, you know, uh, rock versus pop. At that time, you know, when they're driving, you know, the car on the road oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, then all of the other stuff that they go through just to get the tickets. And uh, and uh, that famous scene, as you said before, Pasch, you know, going to Cobo Hall, that's a that's a that's a really, really nice way to show what it was like to be a Kiss fan during those days. And not about the band, because, you know, if we if we pick on the band and if we if we write a story about them, of course, you will always get, you know, saying, oh, you know, you're going to look for the mistakes. So that's not right. That's not, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't about the band. It's about the fans. You know, I, I loved it. And to me, um, I watch it, uh, you know, very often because it's entertaining. And uh, I actually, I, I, I used to, to um, I used the movie to show it to my kids. Well, they're not kids anymore, you know, 22 and 23, but just to make them understand what it was like to go to a show in the 70s. Because as you said before, Carl, so, uh, at, you know, during those days, you were excited to to have, you know, the ticket in your hand. And now you have it on your phone and you don't even remember what it is. You know, it's not the same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. You don't even have physical tickets anymore. That's, That's right. That's right. Yeah. It yeah. All just, yeah. Wow. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you so much. Oh, for doing thanks. This. Thank you. No, and in and, and a sense, Carl, you wrote our story. And that's why, you know, music yeah. fans relate to this movie because it's, yeah. it's really about us. It, it's our story. And, you know, that's why it really disappointed me that the movie wasn't a box office success. I, would, I remember Gene saying, hey, fans weren't jumping uh, through our hoops, you know? It's like, Carl, mm. why do you think that was? Why do you think it wasn't such a, a success? Mm. Well... There have been a lot of theories about that, that it was like the marketing and they moved the release date up because of the, like the Phantom Menace. Um, they didn't mm -hmm. want to compete with Star Wars. So he moved the, the, no. the date up. Um, um, so, but I don't know. I do, I feel like it may have missed its window. Like if it had come out a little bit earlier, I think that it might've done differently. But um, it was one of these movies that, and I compare it to like uh, the, the Iron Giant, which I know it wasn't exact, like it wasn't like a, a huge flop or anything like that. But the Iron Giant was one of these movies that kind of came and went. And then I was like, oh my God, I, I, I saw a trailer for that movie. I was like, oh, I got to see that movie. And then hearing that it came and went. And I mean, I don't know, the, the advertising it felt like maybe the advertising wasn't there, um, but it's it's tough to it's tough to gauge. Like it's uh, um, a movie is always uh, a gamble, I guess yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, sometimes you you hit it on the market, sometimes you don't. Um, there was a producer that I was working with and uh, at the time on another script and he said that um he said the fact that there were no stars in it he told me this before the movie came out which is really cryptic but it was wednesday the movie was coming out on friday he goes he goes you don't have any stars in it and i'm like well kiss is in it he goes yeah yeah but you need, need like you need movie stars in your in, in it to uh to open big he goes not that it, he goes i hope it opens big but um he says if it doesn't that's probably why Okay. So he was, I, I mean, I don't know, is that the reason? I thought Kiss would be enough to sell tickets, but maybe they were looking for like a River Phoenix or um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of who was big at the time, Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. I don't know. Right. Uh, yeah. Maybe if they were in it, it would have opened better, but um, it wouldn't have been the same movie for sure, you know. Um, but uh, in, in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm happy that it became a cult classic, but maybe that's the journey that it needed to take to become a cult classic. It had mm -hmm. to fail at the box office in order to gain this uh, following that I feel like, you know, uh, it's a movie that 
almost everybody's heard of. Not everybody's seen it. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's true. But the people who have seen it really love it. Yeah. I, I mean, I ha I have yet to meet someone who goes who comes up and goes, "Yeah, Detroit Rock City. What was that? Well, mm -hmm. I don't get that. Like, no, it's like Detroit Rock City. Yes, you know. I, I mean, it's it's um, it's found it's found its audience basically. It found yeah, yeah, exactly. the audience that would appreciate it the most. You know, right, right. that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, would it, it would have been nice if it was like you know Titanic or something? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would have been nice, but not not in not in the cards. It just wasn't the the fates the fates weren't having it. So, Car, uh, uh, before we close the recording on this episode, um, what does the future hold for you? Where, where can people get access to your work? All right, so I have a, a website. It's uh, carlvdupre.com. That's C-A-R-L-V-D-U-P-R-E.com, all one word. And um, I have YouTube channel. Um, if you just if you just punch in uh, Carl Dupre, it'll it'll come up. It's um, I believe the at is a twelve a twelve story asylum on YouTube. And I'm on all the, the various social media at Carl V. Dupre. Okay. Uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, or X, I guess you call it now. Um, TikTok, um, Instagram, Thread. Everywhere. So Carl Dupre and uh, yes. we'll find you. We'll find you. <laughs> hey, you'll find me. Yes, you will find me. Yes, absolutely. And um, yeah, I've got another book that I'm trying to put together, short stories. It's going to be a little different, though. There's going to be one of the, it's going to be a novella and a few short stories. So it's not okay. going to be like a 12 story asylum and the 13 story asylum. It's only going to be five stories, but one of them is going to be really long. So. Long. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Almost a book. You know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Carl, you know, uh, we, we can't uh, we can't thank you enough for, for your time. Uh, this has been uh, really uh, you know, fascinating to to get to, uh, to know your story and uh, your passion for things and the, the work that uh, that you have done. So here with PASC, uh, we we try to, of course, you know, we, we always talk about KISS, but uh, we, we use KISS to get to know people and to just to get to know their work. Uh, if they're somehow related, you know, much better. But if not, you know, it's 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 fine because we love uh, we love what you do. So thank you again uh, for your time. This this has been great. Thank you. All right, it was a real pleasure meeting with you uh, with you guys and, and learning about you too. And, uh, yeah, and, and and thanks anytime. You know, I want to give a shout out to John Harrison because we recently interviewed him and. Mm -hmm. Carl, he mentioned you in the interview. Yeah. And it's like, oh man, I gotta have Carl on the show. You know, I gotta, I gotta, yes. I gotta meet this guy. And I, and I can't believe here you are. You know, the screenwriter of Detroit Rock City, uh, giving us the ins and outs of the movie, your perspective of it. It, it was, it was so interesting. You know, and you know, as a young kid myself, I wanted to be a uh, a movie director. It just, it just wasn't in the cards for me. But I was always, I was always into movies. So. Any opportunity to talk about Kiss, talk about movies, talk about Kiss and movies. Hey, it's a win-win. And you know, <laughs> right. thanks to you, uh, Carl, for for this amazing interview, this amazing discussion. It was so much fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun for me too. And um, thanks again. Great experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. So to the Kiss Army, we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas please send them to talk to me at kissarmynationpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, never stop rocking. Take care, everyone. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and X. You can watch us on YouTube or listen to us on Podomatic, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. This is about you, so please like and subscribe to support the amazing guests we have on the show. See you soon, Kiss Army.